Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy any investment based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Midweek Takeaway. Today we're joined by Callum Summit and CEO of Chill Brands. Welcome back, Callum. Thanks, Phil. Good to see you again. Chill has secured a significant sales agreement for its Chill Zero nicotine-free vapor products in the UK. The initial seven-figure purchase order will introduce Chill Zero products to over 1,400 stores, with the rollout expected in Q1 2024. This expansion brings a total number of locations, selling Chill Zero vape products in the UK to more than 2,100, with combined gross sales and purchase orders exceeding 1.85 million since their launch in August 2023. You expressed pride in this achievement and highlighted the opportunity for increased sales and brand recognition. Yeah, so Callum, what can I say? Is this what you were dreaming about nine months ago when this company was in a big pile of not very good stuff? And here we are now with uh, seven figures. Well, just for translation, that means more than a million pounds. So tell us a bit more. Yeah, this is obviously exactly what we've been working towards, exactly what we've been dreaming of, as I say, kind of in the RNS. It's a real validation of our brand and of our products. But forget nine months ago, look at, you know, four or five months ago when we were first getting our products into the UK, when we first launched our 1500 and 3000 puff devices. I don't think we could have quite fathomed that we would get the uptake at this speed and, you know, into, into major retailers in the way we have. So, yeah, we are thrilled and, and very excited about what the future holds now. You know, with, with this deal, we've obviously got mass distribution, mass exposure to a good segment of the UK market. This is a top four supermarket. And, you know, more importantly for our investors, we've now got some real revenues on the books, something that we've not had for a long time in this company. And, uh, you know, I, I think things from here will continue to go very, very well. These supermarkets, these retailers aren't picking these things up in isolation. I, I strongly believe that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and that the more doors you open, the more doors you will open because people start to really get on board. They lose their trepidation around a new brand, a new product category and start to see the upside. And, and this is the, the first piece of that. Yeah, so the 1.85 million of revenue that you've managed to generate from this, just be clear to investors, uh, this is all sales. You you are, I mean, this is not sale or return business. This is not any of that sort of stuff. This is booked revenues that you will receive. Yeah, c correct. So uh, obviously that value that I've given there is not all yet recognized as revenue, but it will be as it's you know put through our books. It's a combination of the sales we've made since the 7th of August and also receivables that we now have. Those receivables you know, kick in, obviously, once purchase orders are fulfilled and stocks delivered to these retailers. But uh, yeah, very much so. We, we aren't structuring deals on the basis of sale or return, not to say we'll never do that, but we're looking to structure deals that give upside from the moment we go in, not waiting on reorders to actually get some value from it. And also, you know, we want some people to take the, you know, the risk with us. We don't want to carry all of that, you know, beyond that. Yeah, obviously there are costs that come associated with uh, expanding at this rate, opening new doors at this rate. I've been very candid about that, but, you know, we and see that this is a, a strong path to profitability. You know, obviously we're also very grateful to Jonathan, Jonathan Swan, who's obviously come in and provided a, an invoice sort of factoring or a supply chain finance facility that enables us to grow at this rate. You know, clearly there are other people in this picture that are, are seeing what's being achieved and being confident in it. And, you know, that's all we can ask for. Yeah, it's great to have the support of a, of a big shareholder, isn't it? I mean, in terms of uh, not being greedy with more and more shares, he was more than happy to lend you the money so it can be repaid as and when required. Uh, I think a good deal for both parties in terms of what, what was going forward. So what would you say is the standout that you've that you've seen happen from august till now i mean basically we we started with a hope a wish that chill zero would would be sold and we have i don't know how many retailers we have today but as in the they they've sold into those retailers with now with this announcement over 2000 stores so just, just tell us what's been the standout of this. How, how welcoming have people been to this product? 
Yeah, extraordinarily positive in their reception of this product. You're right, now we've sold into, not activated all of them yet, but we've sold into more than 2,100 stores in the UK. Uh, an additional footprint, of course, in the US with our recent kind of smoker-friendly news as well. I didn't expect us to get this level of traction this soon, and that is a real testament not only to the quality of our product, to the flavors, but actually the kind of zoom out and look at the macro, the category in and of itself stores retailers distributors wholesalers everybody in this picture is starting to they haven't already see real value in zero nicotine as a category this is a new wave of vaping it's a new area within that whole landscape and the fact that we've come out you know focused solely on that area and uh, and really done it very well has put us in a really great position you know we are Talking, obviously, to additional retailers, as I say, the more doors we open, the more doors we have the opportunity to open. I, I think this news today will be on the screens and desks of additional retailers that we've already you know, teed up meetings with, if not this month, for the new year. So reception has been tremendous. Of course, the important thing, as well as opening new doors, is focusing on you know, making sure that customers actually buy the product from these stores will be driving traffic to them we've got our outbound sales team be working to you know obviously drive traffic in the right directions increase awareness we've got lots of activations for 2024 you know the 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 anecdotal evidence the key here from people who are trying the product on a consumer level is that they taste great they come back and they buy them again and again and you know the the best example of that i can give is is amazon you know we're seeing a repeat purchase on amazon in a controlled environment where we get data up to the minute let alone the day week or month and if that tracks across to the stores we're going to do very well indeed yeah so i take it wasn't the only supermarket door you knocked on no of course not we've been very tenacious with our approach to sales and we'll continue to be that way you know the key is to keep putting the products in front of people and and keep you know, knocking down doors until we're selling in as many places as possible. So, of course, there are other supermarkets that we've looked at, that we're speaking to, you know, can't comment on when they may, you know, they may come to fruition, when we may get a deal over the line. But yeah, certainly I, I think this is the first of, of a number of similar. Yeah. It's, it's very helpful. You know, people in the retail environment, if you're a retail buyer and you're looking at a new brand or a new category, or in Jill's case, a new brand in a new category, uh, there is sometimes hesitation around, okay, but I want to see that this brand performs. When you can see other major retailers, when you can see some of the, the very largest and best retailers and distributors in the country saying, yes, we're in on this product, that eases that burden and it does help with those buying decisions. So I think that uh, you know we, we will see the, uh, the real impact of that as we walk into these these next set of meetings, and I'm very confident that we will pick up additional custom there. You know, I, I think the other thing is we're keen to back our brand. We're not just putting product in the market and hoping it sells. You know, we have many many activations planned for 2024, both in B2B and B2C capacities. Of course, we want to be responsible. Of course, there are restrictions around marketing and advertising vapes. But, you know, we're doing everything we possibly can to get the good word out about the product. And, you know, our retailers, distributors, wholesalers, they're all in it with us because everybody here can make money. We want a win-win. Yeah, I mean, from a retailer's perspective, give us an idea of how sort of profitable it is for them to sell a vape as opposed to, you know, or a chill zero vape as opposed to a packet of crisps or a drink or, or whatever. What I mean... What, what well, are we talking about in terms of differences and margins? Yeah, I, I won't give an exact margin because it, it really varies between retailer, wholesaler, distributor, and I, I wouldn't want to betray any of our kind of retail partners in relation to the margins they're making because that can cause issues you know, in and around the sales chain. What I would say is if you you know directly compare, perhaps not to another consumer product like crisps or, or, or bread or something, because I know that there are obvious issues there in relation to pricing comparisons. Let's just compare a Chill Zero large puff camp vape to a standard 600 puff vape that's on the market today. Standard price for a Chill Zero at 1500 puffs is, is £9. The standard price for a 600 puff product, an Elf Bar, for example, in the nicotine category is that sort of four, five, six pound level, but in the major supermarkets, five, six pounds. They are very tight on margin with the, uh, the classic 600 puff product. Generally, you know, they're making 
you know, and again, it depends on the retailer, depends on the setup, but less than a pound. With a Chill Zero device, you know, you can obviously tell that because we've pushed up the puff count, because there are, uh, there's a higher RRP, there's, there's actually, you know, a lot more margin to go around. It's why we're able to make our sort of 60%, as you've seen here. Obviously, that varies, again, between channel. But, uh, you know, it, it's not costing us enormous amounts more to produce this sort of device over a standard 600 puff you know, a little bit more and the quality is better, the coil is better, the outer materials are more premium and the flavors are great, but it's not costing us an arm and a leg over what an elf bar, you know, manufacturer is paying. So ultimately the retailer is going to be uh, incentivized itself to want to sell these things for sure. And obviously the, the potential health benefits of people quitting the smoking, quitting nicotine and vapes, these are all positives, I think, that the supermarkets will jump on because it's like we don't want to be seen as selling the, you know, those bad vapes, but these ones can be seen, I think, as a, as a more positive way forward, I think. I think there's something to be said for zero as, you know, somewhat until now forgotten area of the vaping kind of puzzle in that actually there are people who you know, get to the end of their journey of, of quitting cigarettes, quitting tobacco, you know, getting onto vapes. And of course, we don't market a cessation claims because those are obviously uh, restricted. But there is a there is something to be said for bridging that gap. You know, Chill fulfills a need in the market for a product that allows people to, you know, wean themselves off of nicotine. There's a lot of dual users of our product, you know, puffing away on a nicotine device and then switching to us and slowly weaning themselves down that way. You know, there aren't all that many products in the market of a, of a great quality at a right at the right price point that, that offer that. So uh, I, I do think that obviously there's a, a good marketing piece around that gap fill within the market. There's always, of course, you know, still just for the general landscape, the general industry, a very strong message that vapes are safer than combustible cigarettes. That is, you know, by and large what the evidence shows. And, uh, you know, I, I think I, I've said this in relation, you know, long ago now to cannabis stocks, CBD, things like that. A rising tide lifts all boats. Unfortunately, in that industry, it's actually been a, a, a sinking tide. And that has uh, <laughs> related to... What is it, a tsunami? Uh, yeah, I, I think that, you know, that's that's a market we'll, that will pick up at some point in the future and, and all the boats will be lifted again. But certainly, you know, in vaping, we've had our fair share of turmoil over the past year with you know, moral panics and, and the media pushing different narratives. But ultimately, you know, the fact remains, if you can create a responsible industry and you can provide a product that helps people to leave behind one of the most harmful consumer products in combustible tobacco that we've ever seen in the history of, of, the, of the human of race. Mankind. Mankind, exactly. Then, uh, you know, that there has to be a route for that product to succeed and thrive, both, you know, on a commercial level, but also on a more sort of philanthropic basis that, you know, is is genuinely helping people. And I, I think that Chill Zero is a part of that picture. Yeah, and I mean, from a government perspective, I haven't probably taken this lightly that in terms of obviously the stock of the vapes, but, you know, they, they've decided at this time, this is a great time to stock something that is, is zero nicotine as opposed to nicotine-based. And uh, this is the way the market, I think, is, is going to be going. Uh, lower quantities of nicotine and then subsequently zero nicotine, and then, you know, either carry on with your zero nicotine or, or quit completely. So it all bodes well, I think, in terms of, and this decision is more than just a financial decision, I think, for the for the, the merits of Chill Zero. So there's a great tendency in any product category for brands and manufacturers to gravitate towards stronger products. That is the same in alcohol with overproof products, it's the same in cannabis with people trying to produce ultra high strength products there. It's the same in nicotine. And the truth is that the customer, while they may feel like they're getting more of something, they don't need it. And actually, they will have a much better experience if they go in the other direction and actually, you know, wind down their use of whatever the active ingredient happens to be. You know, everything in, in moderation very much applies here. You know, as as the vaping industry matures, we get to new levels of sophistication in the consumer market, people understanding what they want, then I, I think that obviously you know, we're positioning ourselves to win in that area and with that philosophy. And uh, yeah, that's the direction I think the market will take. So let's just go back to the financial side of things. We talked a few months ago about chill brands as a whole becoming um, 
cash flow positive. I presume this this deal basically nails it nails it that you will be. But I mean, obviously, I would like you to tell me rather than me tell you. Yeah, it puts us much further on uh, down the path for that. We're very much on course for it. Uh, what I would say is obviously that you know we are expanding very very rapidly, and that expansion comes uh, you know with additional costs. Things like you know rolling out products. You need salespeople in the market. You're shipping products here, there, and everywhere. So there are costs that come with that, and we acknowledge that when we talk about you know obviously the the facility that we have from Ithus One. But on a wider level. Yes, we are on course to, you know, for our deals to be washing their face. And and if you look on a on a business unit by business unit basis, if you look at the commentary in the interims, one of the things that we mention is that, you know, there are inevitable costs of building a consumer products brand, more so than perhaps other kind of areas that, that the markets are used to. But rather than, you know, paying our slotting and accepting, yeah. you know, an equal number in terms of orders coming back and only just breaking even on each deal on a deal basis. We are trying to leverage ourselves into a position, and we've done so successfully so far, where the deals that we're getting, you know, look at these retailers that we've obviously spoken about, you know, today, but also in the in the more recent months, are paying us more than we're paying to get into the stores. That is the key. I don't want to be, you know, going out and buying revenue that doesn't have a margin for the sake of it. We want the deals to wash their face. We want the deals to provide us with growth capital, and in each case, you know, we are climbing the mountain uh, bit by bit. So yes, we're very much on course to reach that sort of major milestone. And, you know, if we do more deals like this, of course, we're going to get there eventually in, in the not too distant future. For the sake of argument, I've taken a supply. Do you think that supply is going to last them a year based on, on forecasts of what's been happening so far? No, I, I really don't. I really don't. Of course, you know, as I said before, we are very keen to keep up with reorder cycles you know all of the, the different retailers and distributors reorder on a different sort of cadence and in a different way but I, I don't think this sort of product will last them the year by any means and you know of course as consumers you know start to pick up the product we'll get a very good feel for when we need to get our skates on put another manufacturing run through for this specific account and yeah keep on selling yeah, so it could be it could be every two months, it could be every month, it could be every three months, could be every four months, could be every six months. We don't know at this stage is is the is the honest answer. But more than likely, with certainly I think one thousand five hundred plus stores oh. it's going to go into. You know, they haven't got a lot of product in each store. You're going to have how many how many vapes in each store? Yeah, very varies between store again, and you've got to look at the footprint between the kind of big supermarkets that are out on the trading estates and yeah. you know compare that to the the smaller sort of convenience stores they they will apportion the inventory they've bought you know in line with the volumes they see in different areas and by different sort of channels within their own estate so I, I can't really give a better steer on that but yeah but uh, we're, we're not talking about even a superstore having thousands of vapes are we we're talking yeah. about them having maybe one or two hundred vapes you yes. know yeah. So so just to give a magnitude of what each store will get. And yes, the convenience stores maybe will get less. Maybe in the future they'll get more because maybe that's where they'll sell more. Um, who, who knows in that situation? Moving on, I want you to give us an idea. Okay, we're sitting here in the end of 2023 and obviously this has been a, a seismic change in what, what has happened with, with Chill, Chill Brands. And obviously we've got Chill.com. But give us some blue sky thoughts about where we would potentially be by the end of 2024 you don't have many figures on it we're just looking for a an overview a helicopter view if you like of where we see the business going yeah i'd say you know obviously let's first look at the context we started in the uk 7th of august and you'll see in the announcement you know we're now up to 2100 locations in the uk that's within a matter of months you know this time next year i would like to be in you know at least another 2100 on top of that but if not more in the uk and i think that's very much achievable obviously you know different stores will perform you know in their own way but you know exposure is everything the reason that the big brands in the industry do so well is because they sell in so many places they're available everywhere and consumers therefore get exposed to them, they get used to them, and then they can pick their favorites and continue to buy them, whatever. I think that we will continue to expand our sort of set of channels. So at the moment, you'll see we've got independent convenience, we've got chain convenience, we've got travel stores, 
we've got our supermarkets as well. In the near term, I would like very much to see us expanding into forecourts. And I, I think that we're not far away from that now in terms of, you know, the petrol stations, the sort of motorway services, et cetera. That is, you know, where people are stopping and buying vapes as well. And I think as well, you know, obviously we'll continue to see expansion in the United States. Smoker Friendly is the first, uh, as we had here, of a number of retailers that will take this product, both online and, and in bricks and mortar. But uh, another challenge, of course, that we will have is then also entering additional countries. So I've spoken a little bit about European and Middle Eastern opportunities. Uh, during 2024, it will very much be a priority for me and our team to uh, you know, cement something on at least a couple of those markets. Uh, that'll be kind of local language packaging. You know, it's easy to get onto uh, now that we're up and running the Amazon sort of platform in different countries, but we have to make sure that we're obviously compliant with their local laws. We have to make sure that we've got the right people in the field managing in these these countries and that's something that I'll be turning my attention to in, in Q1. So that that sort of is the bigger picture on uh, on vaping. I think we will see you know continued expansion of the Chill Zero distribution network. We, you know we'll continue to see sales. We'll see our first sort of major set of reorders coming through the books. And uh, yeah, we'll also see a little bit of new product development, which I'll go into you know as and when it's appropriate. On the Chill.com side, I think I said in our last kind of meeting, we're aiming obviously for for hundreds of brands to be joining us on the site. We're doing very well there in terms of attracting brands. We're now attracting or starting to attract more users. We've got to continue to do that. Our SEO is picking up that as anyone who's familiar with the area will appreciate search engine optimization. You know, it can be a challenge. It takes a long time for it actually to yield any results. And, you know, you're, you're basically planning six months ahead with whatever you're working on in the field of SEO. But, you know, that is now, you know, returning something to us you know as we continue to grow continue to add new brands to the site people are going to start to see you know an uptick there as well both in user traffic in the revenues that returns in the brands that they see and also in the categories of products that are available on that site so i, I suppose that to, to sum all of that up the answer is just continued growth and expansion i think my highlight of 2023 has certainly been people receiving these vapes you know very very well taking to them well, enjoying them. It's great to see a product that you've worked so hard on in stores and in people's hands and them actually liking it. I think for 2024, it's really a year for Chill to become much more recognized. You know, we have now, uh, the analogy I used before was, you know, inviting people to your home once you've renovated it. Well, we've renovated the house. Now it's time to have the party. So we've just had 150 million roughly shares land on the market. What would you say to all those people who hold 2P shares who can now basically make 100% profit? I would ask them if they want to leave value on the table by doing that. Obviously, I can't advise people whether to buy or sell our shares. But uh, what I can say is, you know, at the point of us completing that fundraise back in 2022, the company was, you know, more or less, you know, a, a shell of what it could be. It was, uh, you know, a company that had chill.com as a website. It had a broad direction in tobacco alternatives. And that was pretty much, you know, it. We've now formed a company that is, you know, financially much stronger than that. We've launched products into multiple markets. We have more markets waiting in the wings. Uh, and we're diversified on the basis that we've got, you know, several income streams. We've got US bricks and mortar, UK bricks and mortar. We've got our marketplace and we've got e-commerce outside of chill.com with Amazon and other sites and other distributors, third parties that are known in their spaces backing us to succeed and backing our product to succeed. So what I would say is, you know, if we think that there's been a degree of value created between 2022 to date, effectively, when we're really still at the very beginning of having launched these products, I think 2024 has a, a great deal of, of value still left for us to capture. And, you know, effectively, we have got a foundation now. There's still a lot of building that can and will be done on chill.com as a marketplace with new categories, with head tropics, adaptogens, with new products, new brands, and new customers. But beyond that also, you know, I, I do believe that Chill Zero has the legs to become really a mass market leader in this category, you know, on, on new product development, on existing accounts, on, you know, the flavor extensions, you know, whatever. There's lots of different ways for us to keep sharpening the knife. So the growth journey, in my view, has really just started. We've laid the foundations and that's it. 
Yeah, I have to agree with much of what you said. I mean, I think I think a year and a half ago we were in a salvage situation, and we're now not in a salvage situation. We now have a very very scalable and exciting business ahead of us. Whether it be vapes, whether it be the chill dot com, whether it be another product category that we decide to go into, because at the end of the day, this is becoming a selling company. You know, it's not about necessarily vapes forever it will be whatever is appropriate that we can make a great margin on and make profit for the shareholders and you know so don't get too hung up on the vapes though i think the vapes are going to be extraordinary for the next few years um and in all honesty the name chill and chill zero is a huge selling point and i think that is something that we have to uh, we have to praise and understand that chill.com and chill as a brand it is going to become a household name and if it does then we are talking blue sky i think and that's i think what people need to uh, maybe try and focus on the, the other thing i'd say you know absolutely the other thing i'd say is that you know people in the industry or people adjacent to the industry in in shareholder investor capacities have obviously been concerned about regulation over the course of the last sort of six to eight months in the vaping category. You know, obviously I can't speak to what will eventually happen, but I'm actually quite excited about regulation because I think it's the opportunity for the industry of which we are part to draw a line under various issues to actually move forward with certainty on compliance, with certainty on you know, social responsibility, and to effectively, you know, form new opportunities. You know, Chill is very agile. We can, you know, seize on whatever opportunity is put in front of us, as I think we've demonstrated in the last 18 months. But I, I think that the whole regulation picture is actually a good thing and we welcome it. The industry should welcome it. And, you know, it doesn't really concern me that change is afoot because change is where there is upside potential. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, again, congratulations on all your hard work, Callum. Congratulations on this uh, this deal, which really is the start of of making this, I think, a huge proposition in terms of uh, a company. And uh, yeah, let's get some more announcements out and uh, some more deals. As we said earlier, there are more supermarkets you're discussing it with. If it goes in one, my guess is it's going to go in more than one, but let's see what happens. And uh, yeah. It's going to be very quick expansion, much quicker than you I even anticipated, I think. And, you know, that can only be good for all of us as shareholders. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the name of the game. But yeah, thank you, Kev. Appreciate it. And I think this is, as I say, still the early stages of our journey. There's a lot left in the tank. Yep. Get your butt over to Egypt. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Callum, thanks for your time today and look forward to speaking to you in the not too distant future. Thanks, guys. Good to see you. This podcast was brought to you by Roast PR Limited. If you would like to appear on a future episode of The Sunday Roast, please email admin at thesundayroast.net.